This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. I hope you're well. I hope you enjoyed the recent episode where I spoke with Michael Galway about his book Golden Generations, the story of the 2006 World Cup. Uh, It's still available at your podcast provider of choice or threelionspodcast.com. Uh, really interesting chat, really interesting book. But now, the Women's World Cup, or the World Cup final, was was just a month ago, wasn't it? I can't decide whether it's flown by or gone slowly. Um, but the Women's Super League is yet to start. But the Lionesses are back in action as they have a couple of Nations League fixtures coming up. And as I generally do, I'll be chatting with Rich Laverty about them and also looking back on that World Cup and all that went with it. Now, firstly, Serena Weigman announced her squad on the 13th of September, a 24-player squad. Now, it is pretty much the World Cup squad, but with a couple of uh, exceptions. It is as follows. Three in goal. Mary Earps, Hannah Hampton and Ellie Roebuck. Defenders, Millie Bright, Lucy Bronze, Jess Carter, Neve Charles, Alex Greenwood, Maya Letizia, Esme Morgan and Lottie Wuben moy In midfield, Laura Coombs, Jordan Nobbs, Jess Park, Lucy Staniforth, Georgia Stanway, Ella Toon and Katie Zellum. And then up front we have six strikers. Rachel Daly, Lauren Hemp, Lauren James, Chloe Kelly, Alessia Russo and Katie Robinson. So it's a squad with a total caps amount of 779. Total goals, 119. It is an average age of 25.6. Now, the oldest player in the squad is Laura Coombs and the youngest, Katie Robinson. Uh, The most experienced, the most capped player is, of course, Lucy Bronze with 112 caps to her name. Amazing. It is a squad represented by seven players from Manchester City. Five from Chelsea, four from Manchester United, three from Aston Villa, two from Arsenal and one from Brighton, Barcelona and Bayern Munich. Uh, so a, uh, a fair spread, but seven from Manchester City uh, is, is quite impressive. It just goes to show what the setup uh, at City is like with regards to their women's side. Now, at the time of recording, as I mentioned, the WSL hasn't yet started. Uh, So I've not seen any withdrawals from the squad and not really expecting to. But there is no Kira Walsh. She's out with a calf injury, which is apparently nothing to do with the injury she picked up in Australia. Uh, There's also no Bethany England, who's recovering from hip surgery. Still no Beth Mead although she was on the bench for a recent Arsenal Champions League fixture, which I noticed. And obviously still no Leah Williamson either. Uh, Incidentally, Beth England, I noticed, has been awarded the club captaincy at Tottenham. So congratulations to her. Now these fixtures coming up, as I said, are for the inaugural Nations League for the women's game. Personally, I think the Nations League for the women's game is a great advance. Uh, Back in November last year, when the competition had just been announced, I said this. Now, one final thing before I leave you. You may have seen the announcement of a Nations League finals for the women's game. 
This has been in the men's senior game since September 2018 and has been a great success. It means less friendlies and more competitive games against other teams of a similar standard. I think this is a great idea (laughs) and one of UEFA's better ones. We'll not get away from playing the likes of Latvia, North Macedonia and Luxembourg as we'll always have to play a lesser team as such in the European or World Cup qualifying. But what it does mean is that whilst the Lionesses will be playing more games against the calibre of Germany, Spain, France, etc., those smaller teams that I mentioned will be playing each other on a more level playing field and hopefully, in turn, be able to push their own standards up. So in time, hopefully, we won't be seeing 20 nil, 10 nil score lines on such a regular basis. It appears it's going to be introduced as of autumn next year, 2023, in the lead up to the next European Championships, which are being held in 2025. We'll talk about that in due course. But as I said, I think this is a very productive move. So well done, UEFA. Well done. Wow, so let's hope, yeah, that we don't see too many of those high score lines. Uh, Now, we are in League A, Group A1, alongside Scotland, Netherlands and Belgium. We face Scotland first on the 22nd of September. That's being played at Sunderland's Stadium of Light. And then four days later, we travel to the Netherlands, Utrecht, to be precise. Uh, And just with regards to the recent World Cup, Scotland, well, they failed to make it um, to the World Cup. I think they lost in the playoffs. But our history against them is played 18, won 17. We've only lost one. Now, we last met them in 2019. I can't believe it's been that long. Uh, But it was in the France World Cup. Uh, when goals from Nikita Paris and Ellen White helped us to a 2-1 victory in the opening group game there. And the Netherlands, you may remember, they topped their group ahead of the USA. They beat South Africa in the round of 16 2-0 before they lost to the eventual winners Spain in the quarterfinals in extra time. Our record against the Dutch uh, played 10 one seven, lost one, and drawn two. And we last played the Dutch in 2017 in a European Championships semi final. We lost that day 3 0 to the eventual winners. And who was in charge of the Dutch then? A certain Serena Weigman. This game will be her first against her home nation as manager of the Lionesses. Interesting. That's my pleasure to welcome back to the Three Lions podcast. Hello to Rich Laverty. Hi, Rich. Hi, mate. You okay? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, good. Busy, but uh, no, it's... uh... Good to obviously get the season season going soon. Yeah, I mean it's it's coming around soon. Start of October, I think the the WSL starts, doesn't it? Yeah, obviously championships underway, and, and obviously yeah, we've got the Nations League this week. So yeah, there's always something not uh, not too far away. Yeah, well, so there's little things to talk about since we last spoke. Uh, we last spoke before the World Cup. Um, I'll let you get on with all the. Uh, the busy things that you needed to do over that period of time. But we'll we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, obviously, you just mentioned the, the Nations League. That's what we're... The games we've got coming up this week, Scotland at home and then the, the Netherlands away. Scotland obviously didn't qualify for the, the World Cup, but we, we saw the Dutch during the World Cup. How do we think these two games are going to pan out? Um, they'll be tough. I think that's the beauty of of the Nations League, and I wrote this this morning. You know, it gives everybody 
competitive football, whoever you are, whether you, you're England, you're Scotland, you're Netherlands, you're Latvia, you know, Moldova, Israel, like whoever, <laughs> you get competitive football. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, it's a lot more, you know, no disrespect, but obviously you probably look forward to these games more than you'd look forward to watching England play you know, Latvia again or something like yeah. we were two years ago when it was 20 nil and, you know, they beat, I think, Luxembourg double figures as well. So, you know, they're the game. You don't really, I don't think you really look forward to those matches. Um, and it's not just England, of course, you know, you've got Spain v Sweden and Denmark v Germany and, you know, in the league below, you've got the two islands going, going head to head. So I think it's a good thing. For the women's game, I think it brings in real competition, and yeah, I mean, I think England, with the status that they have, probably go in as maybe just slight favourites for both games, but they'll be tough. Like you know, you have to really on top of your game, and I think that's the point. You know, it's it's to make it more competitive, and obviously, the Nations League. You know, this element of the Nations League leads into obviously the qualifiers for the next Euros, but obviously the whole thing as an entity is is obviously part of the olympic qualifiers as well so you know if you get to the final of the nations league in february you'll you'll qualify for the olympics next summer as well so got that little bit of a quirk that england are the nominated nation for team gb and they've got scotland in their group so scotland could conceivably stop their own players participating at the olympics by beating england in the group so <laughs> that would be quite interesting would be quite an interesting side effect but um no look the games are good and you know it's going to give you six really competitive matches against teams sort of around your level um so yeah i'm, I'm looking forward to it i think it'll be uh like i said it's it's better than watching them win 20 nil so um i think that's a positive yeah, I mean, on the flip side, those teams that we did beat, 10 nil, 20 nil, they get the opportunity to play each other um, and sort of get better in that respect on a on a more regular basis, which I think we've seen is sort of coming to fruition in the in the men's game now. I think there was the Pharaohs in the men's game only, I think they played Poland. I think they, they only lost by two goals to nil when you'd imagine, I don't know, four, five, six years ago, they may have lost by... Uh, a lot more. Um, so, yeah, that'll be, be interesting as to see how this tournament um, pans out going forward. Uh, obviously, the, the game against the Dutch um, is the first time that Serena Weigman will, will take on her own nation, isn't it? Which has got that interesting little quirk to it. Yeah, and I think it'll be, uh, be nice for her to obviously go home. And, you know, I think she's probably... I think you'd have to fight it out to see where she's more loved, you know, the Netherlands or England at the moment. So I think uh, I think she'd definitely get a, a good reception. But I agree with what you said before as well about the teams, obviously down the bottom end, you know, like I said, the Latvias and the Luxembourgs, you know, they get a chance now to compete. And I don't think you ever want to take completely their opportunity to play, you know, the likes of England, because, you no. know, it's great for them as a nation, like, and the fans to, to have, the stature of those countries and those players come to their nation, but maybe a couple of years of this to develop. And then, you know, like you say, they might be in a better place to go and and not beat those countries, of course, but certainly not get beat, you know, by 20 goals. But yeah, I, I think that's a real positive as well. And, and obviously, look, you get rewarded because obviously the teams in League C, if you win that, you obviously get promoted to League B. And, and then next year, you'll be playing a team that's got relegated from League A. So it's not going to take long for you know those teams at the bottom to start actually getting to play some top sides because you've got I think some of the lower ranked teams in League A are like Switzerland's or Wales or Portugal and you know if you're a Latvia or a Luxembourg or someone like that and and you win your league and you play in a team like that again in a year's time you know you, you're still getting some ultra competitive matches and some big nations coming to your country so yeah I, I I really like how the format works um, and how it's sort of, you know, it's a reward for success at every level. But yeah, obviously Netherlands, yeah, I mean, that's probably on paper the toughest game. They had a pretty pretty solid World Cup. Like, they weren't spectacular, um, but they had a solid tournament. They've got some good young players. And yeah, I think it'll be, uh, like you say, nice for, 
nice for Serena to be to be going back home again. Yeah. With the the squad that Serena selected, it's it's a bit of a strange one, really, because as, as we mentioned, the WSL hasn't started yet. So she's just really picking players at the moment who who were basically her World Cup squad. Hasn't really had the chance to to see anyone new in action, has she really? No, she hasn't. And you know, it's I think naturally actually it's so close to obviously the the end of the world cup i i don't think you're ever going to make major changes i don't think england need to make major changes um to where they were at but obviously they've got a couple of knocks um beth england's had a surgery kira walsh has a a slight problem so yeah she just brought the three in that were were obviously on backup for the world cup lucy stanley fourth uh my Leticia and and jess park so which I don't mind. Like I think Lucy Stanley Forth is a probably. I think I said it at the World Cup when Kira Walsh got injured. Like she was probably the best option to take that spot if it had been long term. In terms of she plays as a defensive midfielder for a club, um, so it doesn't shock me that she's in with with Kira out. And yeah, I think Maya and Jess are probably the two leading young players at the moment that weren't in the World Cup squad um, and two players I think will be in the England squad for years to come. So I think we'll see those two certainly probably in quite permanently from now on. Certainly Maya in terms of obviously playing regularly at Man United. Jess obviously will see how regular she's involved at, at Man City this season, obviously going back from, from her loan at Everton. So yeah, I mean, like you've got a squad that obviously has won a Euros that's been to a World Cup final. It's not a squad that obviously needs major surgery on it. You've still got obviously Beth Meads to come back and Leah Williamson, of course, and Frank Kirby. So yeah, there, there's good players to come back in and obviously a couple will have to drop out for that. But it doesn't shock me that uh, she's made kind of minimal changes. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the, the World Cup there. Um, I, I can't wait make my mind up whether it seems a long time ago now or time has gone fast or what. But what a uh, what a roller coaster of emotions that World Cup was. Yeah, it, it's weird. It feels like a long time ago already, um, and the final hasn't even been a month yet. I don't think since the final. Crazy. So yeah, it was a great tournament. Like overall, I think the football was great. I think the the extended format added a lot to it um and some great matches and yeah i mean obviously the legacy of it probably hasn't been what we wanted yet i think in the long term it will be in most places but obviously what's been going on with with spain and and still is going on with spain i think can be a positive for them in the long term in terms of getting the change that they want and probably that they needed even before the world cup um but yeah i I really enjoyed the tournament from a, a football point of view, obviously didn't end as as we'd want to in England, but you know I think Spain through the tournament were deserved winners, and I think when you see what they've been having to deal with behind the scenes, probably makes it even more incredible that that they were able to pull together and and win win it. Yeah. Um, but it also shows the level of talent that they have. So yeah, I, I I hope in the long term that we can remember the World Cup for the good things because there were so many great stories. You know, when you think about Nigeria or South Africa or Jamaica or Colombia, etc. Um, Japan, even you know, I think everyone enjoyed watching Japan. So, yeah, yeah it's uh, it was a good tournament, but yeah, it feels a lot longer ago than than a month. Yeah, no, it's a uh, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed watching it and and just learning more about sort of other teams. Uh, I must admit, I wasn't I wasn't aware about the likes of say how good maybe Colombia actually were um and that they were great to watch really sort of easy on the eye um but i mean we got to just touch on spain uh, a little bit obviously so many things happened um in that final um the, but what comes with it now uh jorge vilda was was sacked or, or resigned um fairly recently and i believe um they they now have the first female spanish manager um you might have to help me on the the pronunciation but is it is it Montserrat Tome Tome or something 
I'm um, not going to lie and say that I'm an aficionado on the on the pronunciation of Spanish names, but <laughs> well, it's Montserrat T O M E um, is how it's uh, how it's spelt. But she's taken this role on, and and there's still players who are sort of not prepared to play for Spain at the moment, isn't there? And they've got Nations League games coming up. Yeah, I mean, they had to delay the the squad announcement on Friday when it became clear, obviously, all the World Cup players plus 16 others were were ruling themselves out of contention. I think it is being announced in about an hour, obviously, from where we're speaking. Um, Okay, we're speaking on the Monday. Yeah, so by the time this goes out, it will be out. What on earth the squad is going to look like, who knows, because 39 players have ruled themselves (laughs) out, which is obviously a a massive part of the pool. And yeah, I mean, I, I think... Obviously, the changes that they want go well beyond just say, well, we get rid of the head coach and put the assistant in charge. Um, there's a lot of things that, that they want structurally behind the scenes and, and extra support and higher standards. And I think you've got an amazing amount of bargaining power when you've just won the World Cup, you know, to yes, say that, yeah. that we want this and we want that. So, um, I mean, they're not small changes, you know, they're things that are going to take time to implement. Um yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, they've got a game on Friday, like, you know, and we're on Monday and we don't know the squad yet, you know, let alone obviously them getting together as what is going to be a brand new group. And I think the Nations League is, I mean, certainly also having the first game being Sweden, you know, the probably the toughest game you could have had. It's obviously a rematch of the World Cup semi-final from last month. Um so in terms of putting yourself in a position to win the group and things like that, and even start to think about Olympic qualification, I think I think Spain have got bigger fish to fry right now than than what comes next. I think they have to piece themselves back together and, and get that right support and that structure in place for obviously trying to make sure they you know they qualify for the Euros. Like I know it sounds extraordinary that we're talking about that maybe being in doubt, obviously as as World Cup champions, but you know if they're not going to have 39 of their best players, then it's going to, under this new format where you're not just playing teams that you're going to be beating 10, 12, 15 nil. Um, then, yeah, obviously by the time next year comes around and, and we're in the, the part of the Nations League that obviously ensures that you qualify for the Euros, you know, if they don't, then they're not going to be there. And I think that's that will be massive egg on, on your face for, for the RFEF. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's a sad situation because we should be looking forward to a great rematch, you know, between the two semi finalists, and it was a great game at the World Cup. But obviously, it'll be a very different Spain team. Um, it doesn't sound like any agreement's been reached. So the squad that gets announced in the next hour is going to be, yeah, and nobody knows. Like nobody knows what it's going to look like, um, and I'm sure it'll still be talented because they've got an incredible player pool. Um, and they, you know, they still got great results in the last twelve months without, you know, all the players that initially walked away. They still beat the likes of the US and Sweden, but this is an even bigger scale now. You know, in that they they don't have any of them, and they don't have any of the World Cup squads. So, yeah, it's um, it's a sad situation, but I think everybody obviously supports them in their fight and and what they're trying to do, and they deserve a lot better than than what they've got. And I think obviously what's happened since the World Cup, you know, there was obviously the 12 months leading up to it, all the eyes were sort of on Jorge yes. Vilda. I think obviously now it's put a lot of eyes on on Rubiales, which maybe weren't there before. Um, and I think it's probably given a glimpse into the sort of the culture and the setup that they've had to deal with. And I think when that's the attitude of the person that's at the very top of the pyramids, it's probably not a surprise when, people below that fall into the same sort of attitude and the same sort of habits um, because it starts at the top. And I think in the last month we've, uh, we've seen that pretty clearly. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting watch to see how it all unfolds and and obviously hope that it resolves itself in the, uh, in the right way. Um, But I'm just thinking about it. Obviously England, um, the Lionesses, they had, um, an issue which they they put on hold for the period of the World Cup um, about payment, I believe it was. Um, and I seem to remember, was it Millie Bright 
uh, obviously captain at the time and, and captain for these two games, uh, said that they would be looking to to revisit that issue when they all get back together, which is now. Are you aware of anything that has been said on that matter since the uh, the World Cup? No, I haven't heard anything. Uh, I think it's still a, an ongoing issue. Um, obviously, there's not been really any media yet around, around the camp. I think that is happening tomorrow, so Tuesday um, at St. George's Park. I'm sure it'll come up. Um, because there's various players that are going to be doing media, don't know who, but yeah, it's um, again, it's it's fighting for what you deserve. You know, England yeah. are European champions and they were World Cup finalists. So I think obviously now that the FIFA prize money was was pretty hefty and, you know, was great for a lot of players and, you know, particularly for England getting to the final, they will have done very well financially out of that. But, you know, there's... Uh, it, the FA pay a certain amount in bonuses to to whoever. Then I think the women have got every. Like I said with Spain, look, everyone should have bargaining power. But obviously, the better you do, the more bargaining power you've got. And like I said, England are European champions and World Cup finalists. So I think if they feel like they deserve more, they've got a right to to fight for that. Obviously, we don't know the ins and outs of the FA's finances, but I no. think it's been pretty strongly rumoured over the last few years that maybe the FA's finances are not in the best position, certainly since COVID. So, yeah, we'll see. But I'm, I'm sure it will come up. Um, I'm sure it'll come up over the next seven days or so. Well, St George's Park is where the, the media events are going to be happening. Are you, are you off to St George's Park and then on to Leicester? Um, I'm not going to St George's Park. I... Hope I won't be in Leicester because the game on Friday is in Sunderland. Sunderland, um, beg your pardon. It's Leicester's the um, the well, next game, isn't it? Yeah, Le- Leicester's the next one. Beg uh, your pardon. Um, but uh, no, I've been Sunderland. Yeah, on on Friday for the game. I think it'd be a good crowd. I think obviously it's good for the Scottish fans, you know, that can just hop across the border. Yeah. Um, obviously, what they mean in the northeast, so pretty sensible choice from from the FA. Yeah, so it'd be a good game. And it'd be a good atmosphere. And like I said, it's, again, not to disrespect, but it's a little bit more exciting turning up for England-Scotland than it was England-Latvia or or England-Luxembourg because, you know, Scotland have got very very good players and obviously players we're very familiar with in the WSL. So, um, no, it won't be there tomorrow. Just got a few other things on. But, yeah, I'll be there. uh, I'll be there on Friday. Well, wish you uh, an exciting game. And from uh, an England perspective, let's hope for a... For a result similar to the the men's game the other day, uh, mm. Rich. Yeah, thank you very much for your for your time. Obviously, Substack is still going well, I assume. It's still going well. I'm trying to get back to some sort of normality now <laughs> after the World Cup in terms of the scheduled getting there. Um, but yeah, no, still going strong, and and yeah, yeah, still enjoying it. And yeah, there'll be plenty of uh, plenty of coverage of of the the Nations League over the next week or so. It. look forward to that uh yeah thank you very much and maybe we can speak again when the next couple of games come around yeah not a problem mate thanks for having me as ever Thank you to Rich there. As always, you can keep up to date with what's going on in his world. You can follow him on Twitter at Rich J. Laverty, and I hope to chat with him again next month, as incidentally, that's when England are playing in Leicester, uh, the 27th of October, to be precise, home to Belgium, Uh, and that is quickly followed by Belgium away in Leuven, which is a lovely part of that country. Uh, I went to the 3-3 game a few years back. Uh, All you need to do is hop on the Eurostar And then it's a short internal train to Leuven. Now, you may have heard a recent episode where I discussed all the England men's transfers. That was with Gary Lambert from Channel England Football on YouTube. Well, now the women's window has shut on the 16th of September. It's only fair that I run through some of those moves by the women since the end of last season. Now, there's certainly not as many as the men, 
And remember, these are just those that affect the lionesses, past, present or future. So we start at the end of May last year. Izzy Christiansen, uh, she's retired. Her last club was Everton. Uh, but she made 33 appearances for the Lionesses. Uh, her debut in 2015. She scored six times. Um, she's most recently been seen as a pundit on the telly. And I think, to be honest, that's probably where we'll see her most now. Uh, a few blasts from the past. So the 30th of June, Jade Moore. Now, she was on the books of Manchester United. She was released by them. She has since signed for Birmingham City. Uh, with regards to England, she made her debut in 2012 and went on to make 51 appearances and score once. Uh, she was actually part of the bronze medal winning team in the 2015 World Cup. Now, probably the biggest move um, of the window regarding the Lionesses was Alessia Russo. She transferred from Manchester United to Arsenal on a free transfer. It's a strange one because in the past, Manchester United wouldn't accept Arsenal's offers, uh, which I think were in the region of half a million. So in the end, Russo left as a free agent. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how she does at the Gunners. Uh, 4th of July, Hannah Hampton transferred from Aston Villa to Chelsea on a free transfer. Uh, there was talk of her possibly going out on loan somewhere. But as yet, I haven't seen anything uh, to confirm that. 6th of July, Lucy Parker transferred from West Ham to Aston Villa on a free transfer. Aston Villa actually um, have made some interesting signings this uh, this transfer window. It'll be interesting to see how they do this season. 22nd of August, uh, I said a couple of blasts from the past, Danielle Carter. Uh, she moved from Brighton to championship side London City Lionesses. Now, Danielle only won four caps, uh, making her debut in 2015 as a striker. Uh, she had a large period of time at Arsenal at the time, but she made her debut for England under Mark Sampson. And that debut came in a European Championship qualifier against Estonia in 2015, where she scored a hat-trick in an 8-0 win, and then scored another hat-trick in the home leg, which England won 5-0. She managed those six goals in four games, which isn't bad, really. Uh, now, I mentioned Aston Villa when I mentioned Lucy Parker. Another player that has gone to Villa uh, is Ebony Salmon. She moved there on the 8th of September, transferred from Houston Dash uh, to the Villa uh, for an undisclosed fee. As yet, she's only won four caps, aged 22, uh, but she is well experienced at the youth level, 14 caps under 17 uh, and 12 are under 19. She made her debut uh, for the senior side in February 2021. I think there is a lot to be expected from Ebony Salmon. Um, be interesting to see how she does. Uh, of course, Houston Dash was the same team that Rachel Daly came from uh, and went to Aston Villa. So uh, maybe Ebony Salmon and Rachel Daly up front together. That could be quite quite potent, couldn't it? Uh, then the 14th of September, Gabby George transferred from Everton to Manchester United. She's earned two caps. Uh, her legacy number was 209. Um, her first cap came in a 6-0 win over Kazakhstan in 2018. She's a defender. Uh, and then the 14th of September as well, Sophie Bagley. Uh, hasn't made a uh, senior appearance yet. But she's a goalkeeper, transferred from Manchester United to Brighton. Uh, but she has made numerous appearances for the Lionesses at under 17, 19, 20, 21 and 23 level. So you'd think uh, she has a good period of time at Brighton 
then she may be in line at some stage in her career for a senior call up. We shall wait and see. So those Lionesses games against Scotland and the Netherlands. The Scotland game will be on ITV4 on Friday the 22nd. Uh, I'm unsure at the moment about the Netherlands game. It will certainly be on ITV, but I'm not sure what channel. You'll have to check the listings nearer the time. Uh, If you're going to either game, enjoy it. Safe trip. Uh, And I'll be back with you very soon taking a look at both of the games. And it's about time I bought you one of those episodes about your England journey. Don't forget, you can get in touch with the show. You can send me an email, threelionspodcast at gmail.com. Or you can get in touch with the show on social media. You can find it on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, threads as well. Don't forget threads. Um, So until the next time, Take care of yourselves. Cheers.